the greatest of all our problems is that although God is our primary need, we're faced with an impossible dilemma. Sin separates us from God's presence and his gifts to us. The results of sin can be seen everywhere. I have worked in a hospital at one point in my life. I saw health problems that resulted from sin, gunshot victims in the ER, murder, rape, selfishness, idolatry, and many other things are all around us to point to the fact that man is sinful. The New Testament tells us that the results of sin in our lives is death. Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Romans 6.23, and the wages or payment of our sin is certain death. Galatians 6 verse 7, what we sow, we will reap. Suppose I only sin 10 times a day, or even five, or even just three, why, I would be practically a walking angel. Imagine if no more than three times a day I did think unkind thoughts, or lose my temper, or fail to do what I ought to do towards God and man. I would be a pretty fine person, would I not? Even if I were this good, I would still have over 10,000 transgressions a year. If I lived to be the age of 70, I would have 70,000 violations of God's law on my record. Think what would happen to the habitual offender in a criminal court with 70,000 transgressions on his record. This illustrates how not only am I a sinner, but also that my sin is a very serious issue. Some people say that there is no sense of sin in the Quran, but they haven't read Surah 51, 59 through 60, and Surah 29, 40. These verses have much to say about the progression from sin to judgment. Surah 51 indicates that those who are evil and do evil will get their punishment. But don't rush God to punish them because it will be a terrible day for them when God starts giving them their punishment. In Surah 29, we see that God catches every person for all the sins that person commits. Some of the people referred to in this verse were stoned and others were seized by a plague. Some were swallowed up by the earth and some were drowned. The point here is that God deals with sin. Everyone is dead in his sins. God does not wrong them when he punishes them, but they wrong themselves by sinning, which inevitably bears the fruit of the punishment. Some of you may be saying, who is this guy telling us we're sinners? Well, I'll tell you now, I am the chief among sinners, and I know that I can never do enough to earn God's favor. So what do I do? It is interesting that every religion offers or follows ritual practices which signify cleansing. They are essentially no more than symbolic tokens and obviously do not really affect anything by themselves. While we may clean our body by such rituals on the outside, we are well aware that water can never wash away sin nor create a clean heart inside the person. Jesus once made a very remarkable statement when confronted about the ritual washing of hands before meals. Don't you see that whatever enters the mouth goes into the stomach and then out of the body? The things that come out of the mouth come from the heart. He's talking about speech. And these make a man unclean. For out of the heart comes evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false testimony, slander. These are what make a man unclean. That's from Matthew 15. Rituals are really no more than a reminder to our need for purification because we know that we are impure. After having committed a particularly ugly sin, David in the Old Testament expressed his longing beautifully in one of his psalms, wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. I know my transgressions, and my sin is always before me. 
Against you and you only have I sinned. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquity. Create in me a pure heart, O God. From Psalm 51. You may be Hindu, Sikh, Muslim, Jew, Christian, agnostic, or something else, and have a need for forgiveness of sin. Truly, this is our greatest need. I'm reminded of a story of Dr. Paul Gupta, born in a very high caste in India and carried the name of a Hindu god. Though he had from his family inheritance everything he could want in life, a home, land, a thriving business, he was over and over again from childhood made keenly aware of his sin. Though he searched, he could not find freedom from his personal sins. Early in his life, he sought ways to relieve the pain and guilt of sin. Those included going to swamis, absorbing Hindu teaching about how to deal with the problem of sin. His life illustrates that many people are well aware of their personal sins and even burdened down by those sins. Now, if you want to get to heaven by your good works, then all you have to do is be perfect. That's according to the great master and found in Matthew 5. Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. God's standard is complete obedience to him in all things at all times. And guess what? We all fall short. There is a better way than trying to be perfect. Do you see now why it is impossible for anyone to get into heaven by their good works? I invite you to get in touch with me and let's discuss our way out. Thanks and have a wonderful day.